I'm Chris Cooney. It's my pleasure to welcome you here to Barrett's, uh, the newest Barrett's property. This ad is added into their collection of properties now. Uh, this much needed meeting and event space joins uh, their other properties in Bridgewater, North Attleboro, and Fall River. Uh, we are happy to be here to celebrate our 20th anniversary Athena Award program. Before we start, please join me in a moment of silence in memory of past Athena Award recipients uh, who are no longer with us, Christine Karavides and Mary Ann Robelcox. Thank you very much. We encourage you to enjoy the delicious lunch provided by Barrett's. Uh, they will be bringing it out once your salads are complete. And we encourage you to continue to eat throughout the program uh, in, in the best interest of time. Today, we recognize inspiring leaders, specifically women, who empower, elevate, and equip other women to play a significant role in strengthening our community, our organizations, and ultimately, our economy. From the U.S. Chamber's recent study on women forging America's new entrepreneurial landscape, some interesting facts and figures. It may see counter, seem counterintuitive, but small businesses have a huge effect on the American economy. As more and more women join the ranks of small business owners, that effect is only going to grow significantly. <coughs> In fact, women-owned firms have grown at one and a half times the rate of other small enterprises over the last 15 years and account now for nearly 30% of all businesses in the United States of America. One critical growth trend for women-owned businesses is the rise of a new kind of enterprise that often employs no more than its proprietor. These jobless, quote, uh, entrepreneurs include corporate executives, technicians, and other professionals who have either by choice or necessity struck out on their own and now are managing their own small businesses or microenterprises. 90% of women-owned businesses have no employees other than the business owner, compared to 82% of all firms nationwide. Only 2% of women-owned firms have 10 or more employees, trailing a 4% rate for all businesses, so that's half. This discrepancy suggests that we can and must do more to support women in their efforts to build businesses in the U.S. economy, create jobs, and grow our economy. More closer to home, a recent Boston Business Journal article revealed women are becoming more of a financing force uh, for other women through angel investing. Women are increasingly controlling more personal wealth than ever before in the history of the United States, in fact, the world. In fact, women control 51% of all personal wealth in the United States today, totaling $14 trillion, and these women are sharing the wealth through angel investing. Uh, investing, 30% uh, of all angel investing in the past two years have come from women, and this segment is growing significantly. Uh, the largest jump in women angel, angel investing ever uh, in records. As women increasingly control the family purse strings, they look for products and services that fit their specific needs in areas like healthcare, caregiving, and retail. The best designers and innovators of these products are likely to be women for women. Uh, and the, the folks that are enabling these women to grow these businesses are women angel investors. So they, the article goes on to talk a little bit about how uh, middle-aged uh, to older white men were basically looking at business plans from younger women who were trying to address needs in the marketplace, uh, yet were not really connecting with those, uh, those dollars, those financing dollars, uh, because there wasn't a connection of the need. Um, so with more women now entering the angel investing, we're hoping to see more innovative products and more women-owned businesses uh, succeed. We are fortunate to have many strong women in leadership roles within the Metro South region. I would now like to introduce one of those women, today's MC, Sue Joss. Sue, yep. <laughs> Sue is, is former board chair of the Metro South Chamber of Commerce and is the chief executive office of the Brockton Neighborhood Health Center. She also is a past recipient uh, of the Athena Award. Please join me in welcoming Sue Joss. Thanks everyone and um, welcome and thank you for coming. This is one of my favorite events of the year when we get um, the rare and honor to, on, um, to honor one of the people in our community who supports the growth of women. And um, I think that's especially um, telling now when so many women, for the most women ever, I think, entering into politics and running for office. So uh, th I think this is a great time to be 
honoring those in our community who have supported women. Um, we have a great program for you today. We'll uh, present a deserving recipient with an import, the important Athena honor and hear from another accomplished woman, Secretary of Labor and Workforce Development, uh, Rosalind Acosta, who I'm looking forward to. I saw your video and it was amazing. Um, yesterday. I watched it while I was waiting for a plane. Um, anyway, I'd like to point out the green forms on your table, um, which, like this, um, these are for questions for Rosalind when she gets up, so you could um, fill those out and someone from the chamber will be around to collect them prior to the Q&A. Um, I would ask you to please, please make them readable. I'm the one who has to read them and I skip by the ones I can't read. <laughs> Bruce. <laughs> um, so before we could begin, I'd like to recognize some of the great leaders in the audience. Um, first, we have our ambassador team who lead the chamber members' membership through outreach and participation. Um, if you could hold your applause until I read the entire list. The ambassadors who have uh, joined us today are Joanne Schneider, who is our ambassador committee chair from Eastern Bank, Reiko McNeil, Bridgewater Savings Bank, Marnie Dutton, uh, Connemara Senior Living in Campello, Catherine Light, Mansfield Bank, Brenda Karens, Old Colony Elderly Services, Richard Hook, Crescent Credit Un Union, and Mar Murray Vetstein from Source 4. If you could all stand. Thank you all. Um, I'd also uh, like to acknowledge uh, fellow chamber board members who are attending today. Paul Anganetti from Bank of America. Kathleen Smith, Superintendent of Brockton Public Schools, Fred Weiler, Matt Osborne from Eastern Bank, and Greg Hart from Summer Street Financial Advisors. We also have elected uh, officials in the room, or coming soon, I think, um, who provide exemplary leadership at representing our community. Um, I have seen so far City Councilor Ian Beauregard. Uh, we're expecting State Rep Claire Cronin. Um, we also have S City Councilor Susan Nicastro, Brockton School Committee member Mark D'Agostino, Brockton School Committee member Tim Sullivan, and Southeastern Votech Committee Chair Mark Lindy. How about a round of applause for her? <laughs> and perfect timing as Rep Cronin just walked into the room. So. <laughs> At this time, I'd like to welcome Mr. Chris Pushkar, Business Banking, Sales, and Innovation Director from Eastern Bank. Eastern Bank is today's Athena Program's premier sponsor. Mr. Pushkar is, has over 15 years of banking experience and leads a large team of business bankers focused on driving revenue, managing risk for the bank, and delivering a great customer experience. I'd also like to add this is a very exciting year as Eastern Bank is celebrating its 200th anniversary. On behalf of the Chamber, I'd like to congratulate Eastern Bank on 200 great years in business and thank you for always being such a supportive member and exceptional, exceptional corporate citizen. Please welcome to the stage Chris Pushkar, who will be interviewed by past Athena Award recipient Barbara Duffy, Vice President of Advancement at Helpwell. First of all, Chris, thank you so much for all the Eastern Bank does for the Chamber of Commerce and as a lifelong nonprofit professional, I want to thank you for the extraordinary support you give uh, area nonprofits. I was on your website and I, I had when I saw the Just for Good campaign, I thought, I know that's a new campaign, but they've always been good. Um, you give 10% of your profits to charitable organization. You have more than 50,000 hours of volunteer time. That's remarkable for a, for a bank that started in 1818 when we only had 20 US states. So I just find that to be really impressive. And I want to personally thank you. Um, we have just a couple of questions. And again, thank you for the sponsorship. Does the bank have any special programs being launched or offered during 2018? Yeah, so first uh, I'll say thanks for having uh, us today. Uh, we, we love to attend the event, meet some small business owners and representatives of the South Shore community, so thank you for that. 
Um, in terms of developments, I mean, we have a really strong commitment to small business uh, in the community. Um, one of the platforms that we have uh, is the Express Loan Platform. It's access to capital for small business owners up to $100,000. It's uh, an application process which takes a couple of minutes, uh, typically have an instantaneous decision and same day funding. Uh, we continue to build out that program, so uh, the capabilities of the types of transactions that it can handle. Uh, we have a, a new release coming out later this year that will enable us to lend to uh, prospects that are um, sole proprietors, it will allow us to do debt restructuring and refinances. Uh, and will allow us to also do increases to existing loans at Eastern. So that's one thing. Uh, we also just launched a new online platform as well for small business customers. So that came out May 30th. Um, so we think that'll be an approved experience for our, our customers. Um, and then we're also working on a customized treasury product set um, for the small business clients as well, which should be out later this year. That's terrific. Wow. Um, what economic changes do you see that small business owners should be aware of in the next 12 to 24 months? Yeah, I think we're uh, in an interesting time right now uh, in terms of the interest rate cycle. Uh, so we're obviously in a rising interest rate environment. We just had another bump this week. Um, so I think if folks um, have maybe some variable rate debt out there or they're thinking about purchasing a long-term asset, maybe a good idea to lock those rates in uh, before they, they increase any further. Um, I think I would also caution small business owners against um, you know, overly aggressive growth where you need to leverage uh, a lot of debt to do that. Uh, we've been in a fairly elongated good economic cycle, cycle and a good credit cycle. Um, and typically you see ebbs and flows in those. So I would advise on small strategic growth and making sure that your business can accommodate that appropriately. I personally know that the bank has a very successful foundation, having been able to secure grants from Eastern. So this year they're designated Advancing Women as the targeted grants for 2018. Can you talk a little bit about that initiative? Yeah, so overall our foundation, uh, we donate, as you mentioned earlier, 10% of our income uh, a year to charity, so it's approximately $8 million. Um, we do that to all different types of charities uh, throughout the communities that we serve. Uh, but we also designate one particular category each year, so last year was focused on immigration. Uh, this year, as you mentioned, is on advancing women. And we designate a, a portion of those donations to that targeted grant. So we approximately set aside about 25% of our overall giving. Uh, probably just under $2 million for this year that will be focused on groups that are dedicated to that um, particular category, which again is advancing women. That's great. Thank you. It's really generous. Finally, what are some of the changes or things that might surprise us about the future of banking? You talked a lot about mobile apps. What other things might surprise us? Yeah, I think a lot of it will be more of the same, actually. So advancements in technology, I think, will continue to come at us. Uh, in the banking space, um, I think mobile capabilities, online capabilities. Um, I think you'll see a lot of players continue to come into the market in the payment space. Um, so you see more and more people getting involved in accepting and sending payments. I think also giving business owners access to capital, uh, you'll continue to see more players. Um, I guess I'm cut off. Um, yeah, um, so I'll try to talk loud, but. Um, you know, I think the other thing is, again, more players giving access to capital for small businesses. Um, I think that's a good and bad thing, right? I think access to capital for business owners is really important. Uh, but I think sometimes the lack of due diligence by some of them can overextend small businesses. So I think just be careful not to borrow too much money too quickly and make sure that you can sustain that growth. Okay, ah, I'm back. back. All right, so on behalf of the Chamber and Chris and the Board, I want to thank you so much for your sponsorship of this event. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. That was a great overview, and thanks, Barbara, for interviewing. Um, I also want to recognize Senator Mike Brady, and um, I looked right past you, and I was looking at people, but welcome. We're glad you're here. The main highlight sorry, I'll try to hold it. That's better. The main highlight of today's program is the Athena Award presentation. Since the Athena's program's inception in 1982, more than 6,700 individuals from over 500 communities around the world have been selected to receive the prestigious Athena Award. 
Athena nominations are sought at the community level and the award is presented to an individual, most often a woman, who has achieved the highest level of professional excellence, given back to the community, and most importantly, assisted other women along their respective leadership paths. Indeed, this focus on mentorship of other women is what sets the Athena Award apart from other leadership awards of its kind. I'd like to reiterate that the Athena program is not solely targeted to one gender and that both men and women are eligible to receive the award. It's through a representation of balanced leadership that communities will prosper and that, of course, involves everyone. Last year, Diane Bell from Bridgewater State University was our 19th annual award recipient. Joining, just to name a few, Janet Trask from the VA Hospital in Brockton, Mary Waldron, Bridgewater State University, Kathleen Smith, Superintendent of Brockton Public Schools, Vanessa Tierney, Bo Brockton Area Multiservices, Loretta De Grazia, formerly, formerly of East, East Coast Petroleum Corps, and Barbara Duffy from Hopewell, who you just saw. So how about a round of applause for our past So today's honoree will be added to a long list of distinguished recipients, and she is equally deserving. June Saba McGuire is the Chief Academic Officer of the Brockton Public Schools. Throughout her career, she's been an inspirational mentor, coach, and leader. She prides herself on identifying strengths and talents of women, both in the field of education and in the community. She's a mentor and support to women and has been instrumental in aiding so many in achieving their goals. The foundations of the Athena Award speak directly to who June is and perhaps has always been. She's a lifelong learner who builds meaningful relationships with everyone she meets, learns from others, and continues to remain connected. Among her achievements and contributions to the Brockton Public Schools, she developed the Footbridge Program with Bridgewater State University. As June strives to create an innovative learning environment in the Brockton school system, she recognizes the unique talents of educators and encourages them to take leadership roles that support the school, the district, and beyond. Brockton Superintendent of Schools, Kathleen Smith, recently summed up June's abilities by describing her as a visionary leader who has the proven ability to lead whole district change. June, she said, pioneered several district-based initiatives that have influenced school turnaround efforts and led to state and national recognition. June is a change agent. The criterion for selection of the Athena Award closely mirrors, mirrors the character of June Saba McGuire. She's a valued member and leader of the community who strives toward the highest levels of professional accomplishment. She has excelled in her chosen field and has devoted time and energy to her school and greater community in a meaningful way. She has changed the lives of countless generations of children and families who along the way has opened doors to that so that others may follow, lifting women to explore their own abilities and find their own paths. She is a most deserving <coughs> and recipient of this distinguished honor. It is now my distinct honor to recognize the Metro South Chamber of Connor Commerce's 2018 award recipient. Please join me in welcoming June Saba McGuire. I have to say, I did just hold that same exact statue in the superintendent's <laughs> office, and my first <laughs> remark was, that's really heavy, I hope I won't have to hold <laughs> So, good afternoon. I must begin by saying that I'm truly appreciative, appreciative to be receiving this award and having reviewed the list of past participants, which I just did last evening, many of whom I've had the privilege to know. I am even more honored. I see Mary, again, Mary Waldron here today, um, Barbara Duffy. I saw names on the list such as Shayla Stewart, all women that I've had the great fortune to work with in the past. And I, I'm so happy to see you here today, Claire, because I consider you somebody, a woman who I've often looked to with great admiration. The symbolism inspired by Athena, goddess of Greek mythology, I am Greek, um, <laughs> so I can't say that I didn't love that little aspect of this old word. Representing strength, wisdom, courage, and enlightenment, and one that kind of made me laugh, 
that of strategic warfare. <laughs> because I have to say that each of those characteristics are ones to which I aspire. And yes, even at times, strategic warfare. <laughs> but in a year where there has been an intense focus on empowering women, this has an even more significant meaning. I must say, though, that I share this award with the many women and men who have been the guiding influences in my own life. As I thought about how to adequately express my appreciation, I was reminded that not one of my accomplishments have come without someone believing in me, mentoring me, teaching me, inspiring me, and lifting me through the many times I've experienced challenges that at times could be quite discouraging. And then those are the very same people who celebrated my successes for me and with me. But I also have to thank my mother, who sadly for my two brothers and two sisters, passed away at too young of an age. Our mother instilled in me though at a very early age that she expected that I would grow up to be an attorney. Now that was because I was always questioning and challenging, something my sister can attest to, everything, and honestly it did drive her crazy. So even though that's not quite how things turned out, it did signal to me that I had the potential to do something meaningful with my life. And that makes my mother the first Athena in my life. So instead though, I took an early interest in being a teacher. And like many young girls, I played school often and I had a classroom set up in my basement. I'm sure many women in this room can share that experience. But perhaps a sign that I took it to a whole new level can be shared by my sister, Andrea, who is here today, because I took it to a whole new level with her, and she was often subjected, most times unwillingly, to being my student for hours. <laughs> and I do thank her for that. The most important role that I have, though, in life is that of being a mother. And I do remember this very vividly, that I had once been asked how many children I have, and my response was four sons. And that person, in somewhat of a sympathetic tone, said to me, God bless you. <laughs> and I remember responding, but God has already blessed me. And I have to say, I'm incredibly proud of the young men that my sons are, and that they continue to be a source of inspiration to me. Nick, Stephen, Nick, Matt, and Mark. So I couldn't be any luckier as a mother. But then, I also have the gift of sisterhood. And that is something that I cherish. My sisters, Andrea and Lisa, who lives out in California, so she couldn't be here today, are truly my lifelong best friends. But then I'm also so blessed to have the friendship, love, and support of so many phenomenal women. Women, including my longest, and she's probably going to stop crying, because she, she was before I left the table. <laughs> My longest and eternal best friend, Margaret, who has supported and never failed to encourage me to keep chasing my dreams. <laughs> I've had to deal with this most of my life. I just, <laughs> despite the obstacles. There are many women whom I consider to be my closest friends, women who support me every day, professionally, personally, and among those that are here today are Sue, Judy, Sarah, Val, and then I have my son's girlfriend, who is behind this camera, Bianca. And I have to say that Bianca is really symbolic of women and courage. She moved here from Romania by herself. Her parents are back home. She does go and visit them, and they visit her. But she has truly built a life here for herself and continues to excel in her own professional career. And it means so much to me that all of you are here, and I thank you. But I do believe that there is something in life, and that is fate. And there are moments that people come into your life for a reason. And that couldn't be any better illustrated for me than when I moved across the street from a person who would have a dramatic effect on my life. A person who I've come to know very much like a sister, a friend, a confidant, a boss, a colleague, and most fittingly for today, an Athena. When we met, I was a young stay-at-home mom. I was, had three sons at the time. They were all under the age of five. As I got to know this person, she took an interest in me and began to encourage me to go back to school. Over time, my respect and admiration for this person has only continued to increase. 
It just so happens that this person was an educator. And it was then, through her encouragement, that the spark for me to return to school, beginning my journey of becoming a teacher, became anew. And I can't thank this person enough. And this person is Kathleen Smith, our Rock and Public School Superintendent. So back to school I went, but having three young sons to bring up and going back to school meant I had to rely on the support of many, and she knows what's coming. So none was more important than my sister, who despite having to endure those long lessons, still <laughs> believed in me enough to step in and babysit three young kids, boys, under the age of five. And she did that so that I could start to attend evening classes. And as she reminded me, and I had to get it in here just this past weekend, she often ended up finishing my laundry. <laughs> and I think that she was saying that she suspects that I conveniently left it not quite finished. <laughs> Which is probably true. But now at least all that practice for her has been put to good work because she has four beautiful young daughters. <laughs> And what she works hard to do is to instill in them the independence, the will to be independent, strong, wise, and courageous young women. So when I was notified by the superintendent about receiving this award, I was honestly, I was shocked. I was completely surprised. I felt so humbled. But having the opportunity to read the nominations that had been submitted, those feelings truly changed to those of pride. Pride because the women who nominated me are women I've known for much of their lives. And they're women whom I have so much admiration and respect. Those women are Mary Beth O'Brien and Michelle Zachary. And they are two of the most intelligent, fierce, passionate educators in the Brockton Public Schools. And their commitment to the students and families of Brockton are demonstrated through the work that they do every single day. So to read the words they have written and to hear from them how much they believe I have influenced their lives truly moved me to tears. I would also like to thank my very dear friend, Carol McGrath, again, another equally passionate, committed friend, educator, and principal who just came from Fun Day. She said should be renamed Stress Day. <laughs> and who goes above and beyond for her students every single day. So in the Brockton Public Schools, I have worked with some of the most committed and talented women. They are continuously working to empower the women who work alongside them, and of course, the men. But when I think about the symbolicism of this award and I reflect on the attributes it represents, I can't help but think about the team that I have the good fortune to work with each and every day. And when I say it's an all-star team, I mean it's an all-star team. And those women are off from the Office of Teaching and Learning, Dr. Heather Ronan, Dr. Julianne Andrade, Karen McCarthy. I think, did Sharon make it? Uh, where is Sharon? Oh, thankfully, I'm so happy to see you here. I think, which parents did you go to? Common mistake, common mistake. <laughs> And then we have, I also see that Karen Watts is here, another very talented woman that I work with in the Brockton Public Schools. All of these people have the same passion provided for providing educators with the highest level of professional support so that they are able to best meet the needs of our kids. And then the superintendent's executive administrative assistants. We have Wanda Alves and Patty Belchunas who is anyone who knows anything, and I mean that anyone who knows anything, realize that they are absolutely the hub of the entire Brockton Public Schools. <laughs> and I'd also like to thank Michelle Bolton for her excellence in spreading the good word about the work of our district and her supporting me in receiving this award. But of course our team does include many incredible men and they bring their, and if they do, I know we should applaud for them. <laughs> and they bring their energy, commitment, and expertise to the district and they play such a large role in supporting me in working toward accomplishing our goals. And they include Mike Thomas, who's our deputy superintendent, 
Yeah, he snuck in. He always sneaks in the back door. And then, and then Aldo Petronio, our chief financial officer, and I have to say I often do have to shake him down for money. <laughs> right, Aldo? That's true. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to also acknowledge and thank both Tom Minicello and Tim Sullivan. And if Mark is here, I heard you mention Mark, but I haven't seen him come in. Mark D'Agostino, they are members of our school committee. And they are absolutely fierce advocates for the students and families of the Brockton Public Schools. Despite the challenges that we have and we continue to face, these are the people who are committed to our schools, our work, and our community. And I am proud to call each one of these people colleague and friend. Now, I want to say today is uh, about Athena and it's about women and leadership. And I want you to, to know that I do recognize that it's not enough to be a woman who holds a leadership position. For the truth is we are held to a higher standard. And many times we are scrutinized and criticized for the very strengths that are associated with Athena. But some associate those exact traits as being something negative. So to be able to stand up to this kind of challenge that's just, it's not a one man and it's not a one woman job, you have to be willing and you have to surround yourself with people who are willing to advise and mentor you, people who are willing to take risks with you, people who are willing to lead with you and to stand for what is right, even when at sometimes it comes at great professional and personal risk. And really, when I said earlier about the strategic warfare, I'm learning that's where that can come in really, really handy in <laughs> learning. So thankfully, I have amazing mentors who are Athenas and who demonstrate this strength and courage and act on it every day. And I also thank the Metro South Chamber of Commerce for making this award an important and annual event. And I hope that through this type of recognition and acknowledgement and valuing these qualities in women, that this continues to become more of the norm, and that people who see things as otherwise recognize their own biases, and that these types of celebrations continue to pave the way for future generations, for young women like my own nieces. Thank you so much to the members of the Selection Committee for this incredible honor. And I have to thank my husband, Mark McGuire, Not to be confused with the baseball player. <laughs> so as he has, and he continues to be my anchor, and he offers his unwavering support, and no matter what the situation is, he is always on my side. And because the superintendent, who was recognized with this award in 2013, I'm right about that, and forgot to thank her own husband, <laughs> I would like to take this opportunity, Jerry. <laughs> I would like to thank you for, for Kathy, but, <laughs> but also for me. Thank you, Jerry, because you have always been a support and a mentor, both to Kathy and to me. So thank you. And I'm so glad you came. <laughs> So in closing, I've had the opportunity to work in a field that has the potential to truly make the, a difference in the lives of students and the community in which I serve. And I couldn't be any more grateful for what this profession, which is so much more than a job with what it has provided for me, which is a true sense of purpose. I thank you all so much for this award. I was going to hold it up right now, <laughs> don't, say, don't but I'm not. <laughs> Because what I will do, though, is use this award as a daily reminder of my responsibility to continuing to recognizing, supporting, <coughs> supporting and mentoring women as they strive to reach their own goals, whatever they may be. And thank you so much. I really, truly really appreciate it. Congratulations, Jim. You're truly an inspiration, and, and we have more for you. I'd like to invite Representative Clara Cronin and Senator Mike Brady up to the podium. I could do a little. Thank you. Thank you.
Before we give the citation to June, I want to thank all the past recipients because you are truly what makes us the city of champions. And to everyone who works in our school department of Brockton, despite what the Board of Education tries to do, cutting the funding and playing around with the foundation formula, we have some great advocates in the Brockton Public Schools, June and our superintendent and all the teachers and staff in we are very supportive of you at the state delegation from Brockton, but without your advocacy coming in to the state house, giving us the information we need to push for more funding and so forth. Fortunately, we were able to get more funding, <coughs> excuse me, for the Brockton Public Schools, but we could continue and we will continue to support you because I am so honored to be a senator with all the good accolades, and I know Representative Claire Cronin feels the same way and the rest of our delegation. We get constant accolades from other state legislators. What are you guys doing at Brockton? How are you doing it? And it makes us so proud and honored. And I was a graduate of Brockton Public Schools, and Claire Corner was. And I have to be honest, the kids coming out of the Brockton Public Schools are doing a lot better than we do with less than we had when we were in the public schools. So God bless you, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart for what you're doing for our school system in Brockton. So. And words cannot express, because I remember June, as she grew through the public school system as a teacher in a Huntington School and moving on, and this is a little citation from the state delegation in recognition of you being chosen of the Metro South Chamber of Commerce 20th Annual Athena Award winner, and congratulations from all of us at the state level. Thank so. you so much. And if I may, we have another quick citation as well, because this is the 20th anniversary oh. of the Metro Soul. So if we can get Chris Coney up here as well. And this is another citation from the State House for the Metro Soul's 20th Annual Athena Awards Luncheon. So this is in recognition of your 20th anniversary as well. So Thank you, Senator. Get, get in the middle here with uh, Joan, and congratulations. Oh. And, and one last thing, we want to, you know, the angel investments and all those things, we are pushing for more support for women out there in the community in the Commonwealth. And we finally passed a women's commission that can pass through the legislature for Plymouth County, which ironically, other counties had it, it was not in Plymouth County. And with the advocate, a lot of the business leaders in this room today, we finally got that, that passed at the state level. So, thank you. Well, once again, how about a big round of applause for our newest Athena recipient, June Sabah McGuire. Congratulations again. Our keynote speaker this afternoon is Secretary Ros Rosalind Acosta of the Office of Labor and Workforce Development. In her new role as the head of this important part of the Baker Polito administration, Secretary Acosta leverages her passion to make the world a better place for the next generation to ensure that workers, employers, and the unemployed have the tools and training needed to succeed in the Massachusetts economy. Prior to joining the Baker Polito administration, Secretary Acosta spent over 30 years in the banking industry and is known for her ability to drive positive performance outcomes aligned with the company's mission. She has been named one of Boston's most, in most influential women from the Harvard Club, El Planeta's top 100 most influential Hispanics in Massachusetts, and Get Connected's 100 most influential people of color in Boston, just to name a few. She's involved in many civic and community endeavors. Secretary Acosta is a recognized leader, public speaker, and cultural ambassador on matters of diversity, motivating youth, and Latino leadership. The common strands that run through her life and career are leadership, mentorship, passion, and success. Her work in her previous roles as, uh, as board member of the Boston Foundation, board overseer at Boston Children's Hospital, where she was a founding member of the Milagros Para Niños, and corporate advisory member of her Boston chapter of the Association of Latino Professionals for America has touched the lives of many. Born in Cuba, she earned a Bachelor of Arts 
degree from Wesleyan University in Connecticut, where she was a member of the women's varsity ice hockey team. And if that's not enough, she's also the proud mo mother of five children. When do you sleep? <laughs> uh, so please help me wel welcome Secretary Rosalind Acosta. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry you had to endure that entire long bio. Can you guys hear me? I'm just trying to not hold this thing. Um, so June, congratulations. What a wonderful award. You know, today we're celebrating, the Athena Awards are celebrating you, but every day is a good day to celebrate women. So I'm glad that, uh, that we're here celebrating you. It's also very glad that we're awarding a teacher, an educator, a lifelong educator. Uh, I have a very soft spot in my heart for educators. Uh, both my parents uh, were teachers, uh, and their biggest disappointment is that I did not become one. But all I say is not yet. Don't worry, I'm not done yet. So uh, thank you all for having me here today. It's really a, a beautiful day outside and a sparkling day in here. So I'm, I'm happy to be uh, with you. And, Chris had asked me to share just, you know, kind of a little bit of what's going on um, in our secretariat. Um, what are we doing, you know, how's the economy doing? What are we doing with some of the challenges that we, that we see out there? Um, if you guys were uh, reading your, your iPhone, you saw that uh, we just released our unemployment rates. Uh, they're three and a half, it's at three and a half percent, which is for the eighth consecutive month, we're at three and a half percent. So, and 2017 was the first time in seven, 17 years that the unemployment rate was below 4%. So definitely a strong and stable economy. And you know, some, of, some of these numbers are in spite of the aging workforce that we all have to work with, um, the numbers are, are growing. The amount of unemployed persons has dropped by nearly 60,000 uh, from when Governor Baker took office. Uh, and, and it's been the smallest amount since 2011. And we continue to add jobs in key economic sectors, and one sector that's growing really, really strongly is our professional business and financial ser uh, scientific services, which added over 10,000 jobs uh, this month alone, in this past year. Uh, there are currently, and this is the statistic that, I, that we work on and, and uh, and really gives you a good sense of where we are in our economy. There are 200,000 job openings right now in Massachusetts. And you know how many people are looking for work? 150,000. So that delta just doesn't work, right? So there's a there's that 50, so even if we employed every single person, we still would have a need for more. So so we're either going to have to organically grow more people or figure out a way to get more people into the, the workforce. Um, you know, and while there's, there's great news on so many fronts and, you know, we have such a strong economy, let's also remember that averages are just that, right? Averages are averages. So uh, while places uh, like the Metro South has a relatively low unemployment rate of 2.6%, you guys are rocking, you're doing really well, places like Lawrence are at 6.5%. So if you look at uh, regionally, there are some definite disparities in the unemployment rates. But then if you look at uh, certain sectors of our population, if you look at Latino populations, and if you look at, at the black population, the unemployment rate is over 7%. Right, uh, and if you look at wage gaps, so Massachusetts has the highest average wages in the country, the highest average wages in the country. That's the good news. The bad news is that we have the highest and the largest wealth disparities in the country. And what does that mean? That means that a white household earns about $82,000 annually whereas the average Latino household earns $32,000 annually. That means that college-educated working women are paid 7% less than their male peers in their first year out of college. That means that Latino women make 50 cents to a white man's dollar. So we have a discrepancy that we need to work on and my primary role as Secretary of Labor and Workforce Development is to make sure that we're addressing 
some of those disparities uh, and some of those gaps. So to that end, uh, when Governor Baker, because all of these numbers are, they're old, they're not new. Um, when Governor Baker took office, one of the first things that he did by executive order was to sign an executive order to begin what's called the Workforce Skills Cabinet. And the Workforce Skills Cabinet really is a combination of our Secretariat, Secretary of Education, which is critical in everything that we do, uh, and the Secretary of Housing and Economic uh, Development. The three secretaries and their teams, we meet every two weeks. Um, and we meet because we know that there is still a stubborn gap in those middle wage jobs uh, that we need, to, uh, we need to find answers to. Uh, we align our goals, and more importantly, which I, because I think this is where you know, the, the rubber meets the road, right, is we align our grants. Um, many of us uh, receive federal grants, uh, and we also receive state money. But it's really important that we work collaboratively um, because all, all three secretaries get money for training. But it would be really, really silly if we, if we did that in a vacuum. So about a year ago, uh, as part of the Workforce Skills Cabinet, uh, we started what's called the Regional Planning Initiative. And um, for those of you that don't know, we have uh, 30 career centers throughout Massachusetts. I'll be talking a little bit about that uh, in a second. Um, and 16 workforce investment boards. We've got Sheila here in the back. Sheila, raise your hand so everybody knows who, who you are. Executive Director of our Workforce Investment Board. Um, and uh, you have a fan over here. <laughs> I'm sure you have others, but <laughs> someone was clapping for you. Uh, uh, but uh, so what we did was we, for purposes of planning, we have 16 workforce investment boards that oversee our career centers. And for purposes of planning, we put together uh, those 16 uh, regional planning um, boards into seven so that they could have a conversation about the specific needs in their regions. Uh, from a statewide perspective, we uh, hovered over with data. So we brought in some labor market information and we talked about what are the demands in your region? Who are the employers in your region? What are the openings in your region? What are the skills, skills, underscore skills that they need and the credentials that are needed um, in order to fill those jobs? And then the supply side, we hovered over, gave supply side information. What are some of the things that you, that who's, who's graduating uh, was the other element of this. Who's graduating from high school, college, community college, what are the skills, again, focus on skills. What are the skills that they have? And if they didn't match, and, and in most cases they did not, uh, then we needed to do something uh, through these uh, regional planning, through the regional planning process uh, to try to figure out how to get this bridge built. So the regional um, teams did a great job. They presented to all three secretaries in December. They finished their blueprints um, in March. Uh, and now it's implementation time. But what I really loved about this entire strategy was that, you know, the, the silliest thing that we could do as a state is to sort of come in, hover over, and say, okay, Metro South, you're going to have this strategy. And oh, by the way, Cape, you're going to have this strategy. And Berkshires, you're going to have this strategy. And it's all going to be the same. That would be silly for us to do that. We really need the region's help um, to have that authorship of what you know your locals, uh, your locality better than anybody else. Um, so help, uh, help build that solution. But uh, what we did notice from a state perspective, and, and I think one of the things that was uh, you know, certainly enlightening, um, enlightening for me and um, uh, educative uh, at the same time was that there's so many uh, commonalities in what the Berkshires to Cape Cod needed. So while there were individual needs that each uh, region had um, that maybe differed from another. The high level priorities that came out of this, um, of this conversation were the need to focus on three priority areas. One was healthcare, one was uh, uh, manufacturing, and the other was IT. And we were really focused on those middle wage jobs, that thirty to seventy thousand uh, dollar a year job. Uh, what we know now is that if we do absolutely nothing and we don't really attack the problem about uh, on the openings that we currently have, we'll have a deficiency of about 25,000 jobs in these priority industries in the next five years. Healthcare, as you know, uh, is our largest industry in Massachusetts by far. Our largest employer in the Commonwealth is Partners Healthcare System. 
Um, if we do nothing at all, uh, there'll be about 15,000 job openings mm -hmm. in 2024 uh, in the healthcare industry not filled. Uh, manufacturing, believe it or not, will have about 10,000 jobs unfilled. <laughs> And in the IT space, uh, today there's already about 8,000 jobs unfilled in the IT space. IT space falls a little bit outside of that middle wage uh, band because a lot of jobs in IT are higher than that. Uh, so uh, we obviously need to do a lot of work uh, to make sure that we're filling those, uh, those, job, um, those job openings. And, um, and I'll talk to you a little bit about some of the ways that we're doing that. As part of the regional planning process, one of the things that we also realized uh, as we surveyed employers was, and I am guilty of this, very few employers knew about our workforce system. Very few employers knew that we had 30 career centers throughout Massachusetts. Now, Sue told you that I came from the private sector. And I've been working in the private sector for over 32 years. This is my first public sector job. I've been a hiring manager probably, probably for about 20 of those 32 years, or if not more. I never used a career center in my life. I honestly didn't even know that they were there. So that's been a little bit enlightening for me. Um, and the reason I didn't know it is because our 30 career centers and our 16 work for, workforce investment boards have 46 different names. And, uh, and I think uh, any of you uh, in business or not business, if you call something 46 different things, you're probably not going to think they belong together, right? They're not in the same basket. Uh, so we, uh, we went through a pretty intensive process um, with consultants and uh, surveys and stakeholders. Uh, and we had about 16 potential brand names, uh, 16 potential logos. Uh, we did more surveys. Uh, this was a year-long process. And we did come up with a name uh, that you will all begin seeing uh, over this year. And the name is Mass Hire, H-I-R-E, not to be confused with the cannabis work that's being done right now. Uh, so, um, so Mass Hire, you will now see throughout Massachusetts, um, beginning uh, this summer, we'll have our big launch. And, uh, and then by the end of December, everything, workforce investment boards and career centers will all be renamed Mass Hire with geolocators so you know what city you're in in case you forgot. Um, but the purpose of this is to really unify our message, unify our brand so that employers and job seekers know where to go. When we did the survey to find out how many employers knew who we were, about 6% of them could actually name a career center. So that's not a really great marketing plan, especially when so much money is going into this public workforce system. So really looking forward to uh, working with, um, with our career centers and our workforce investment boards on this. And this is really not just about a pretty name on a door. This really is about branding and culture and, and service and making sure that if you're walking into our Brockton Career Center, it's the same experience that you're going to get if you walk into our Fall River Career Center or our Career Center in Lawrence, et cetera. Um, and we have a lot of work to do because if you think about the way that we are administering right now our career centers, we have 30 career centers, but we have 351 career centers throughout Massachusetts, right? All right, it was 351 cities, I'm sorry, in Massachusetts. So that means that someone's always traveling to our career center. And it's kind of a brick and mortar system. It's, uh, I think I'm, am I, am I uh, creating chaos? Um, so it's kind of a brick and mortar system, right? And uh, like, kind of like a 1980s deliverable. And we really kind of got to think about that. So part of the branding really is to start thinking about a multi-year process, a multi-year program to really modernize our career centers. We have got to use technology a lot more. I want to be where the people are, uh, not necessarily have the people come to me. Uh, and we've got an awful lot of high schools and colleges and, li and libraries in our Commonwealth. Can we do better? Can we do better bringing resources to the mobile phone uh, versus, um, versus into a career center? So stay tuned for that. Uh, that's sort of my next itch, uh, is to make sure that we're modernizing the way. We talk a ton about future of work. We talk a ton about 21st century pipeline. We have to start talking about 21st century deliverable. 
uh, of these services. Uh, so that's one, one thing that um, I will be working on um, as long as I'm here. Um, workforce Training Fund, I want to talk to you a little bit about that because not a lot of employers know about it or use it and you're paying for it. So the Workforce Training Fund is money for you employers, and I know we have a few out here, uh, that you can use for training your workers. Uh, any skill that you need to improve with your workers, you can apply to our quasi um, organization, Commonwealth Corporation, for workforce training funds. We give away about $23 million a year in workforce training fund grants. And that can be used for a myriad of things. Our manufacturing friends have really got that down. I mean, they come in a lot um, and, uh, and they have their grants and they get them and they upskill their workers and it's great. It's exactly what they're for. But another use of the Workforce Training Fund also is for English as a second language. So if you have a cohort of, co of uh, workers that uh, need to improve their English, and we know how critical English is for retaining jobs, getting promoted, uh, quality of life, understanding your children, although I think it takes more than English to understand your children, um, it's also critically important to the fabric of a family to making sure that you're speaking the language. Um, so you can use the workforce training funds for ES ESOL. So um, if you don't know about it, uh, feel free to call our office or just go to the Commonwealth Corporation um, uh, website and we can uh, and we can help you with that. I mean, we've given over 48 million dollars um, in workforce grants uh, since the Baker Polito administration took office. Um, we've trained over 34,000 workers and about 600 different businesses in Massachusetts have taken advantage of uh, of the fund. So please do. Um, I'm just going to run through a couple of other things because I really want to leave uh, time for questions and I know that some of you have to go back to work, right? You're not just here to have lunch at the Metro South Chamber. Um, I know Chris is a really compelling and charming individual, but I know that some of you need to, need to go back to work. Um, one of our, uh, ma the major initiatives that we have this year is the Apprenticeship Expansion Initiative. Uh, we do a really good job in Massachusetts with apprenticeship programs in the trades and we've got about 9,000 uh, apprentices right now in the trades, uh, which is a great number. Uh, we really want to take a page out of the out of their book because it's been so successful, and take apprenticeship programs to different industries. So I mentioned to you earlier that in our regional planning process, we had identified manufacturing, healthcare, and IT as priority industries for our economy and our in our state uh, over the next several years. Well, we want to diversify uh, our apprenticeship programs into those. Uh, into those industries to make sure that um, that that workers are, are ready. Um, it's a portable, it's a very portable um, skill, the registered apprenticeship program. Actually, you could take from one employer to another. Um, but it really has served as a tool for retention, better quality employee, uh, better morale uh, within companies. Uh, so we'd love to talk to any employer that is interested in that. We have two goals uh, in our apprenticeship uh, initiative. One is to diversify industries, as I mentioned, but two is also diversify the folks taking advantage of the apprenticeship program, because right now in our trades, um, we have about 64% of those in the, of that 90,000 are white males, and we need to make sure that we are expanding that to women, um, uh, people of color, veterans, uh, disabled, etc. cetera. So uh, critically important for us to reflect the communities that we, that we serve here in the Commonwealth. A um, couple of more things. Um, I, you, you guys have actually not gotten as affected as some other places in the uh, state with the evacuees from Puerto Rico. Um, let's not forget that it was not that long ago. That was in the fall. Some people are living that still every single day. Massachusetts has seen about 4,700 folks uh, come uh, from Puerto Rico and are on FEMA assistance right now. We have seen about 1,300 of those folks come through our career centers. About 825 of those folks have landed in Holyoke. So Holyoke and Springfield uh, have gotten the bulk of, um, of our citizens from Puerto Rico. Uh, the sheer fact uh, is that, uh, that Hampton County has about 30% of the Puerto Rican population. 
of Massachusetts and immigrants follow their families, uh, and that's what we're seeing. And I tell you, the, the career centers all over uh, the Commonwealth but uh, have done incredible work because they have actually, got, these career center uh, staff have become social workers. Uh, they're, they're partnering closely with our family resource centers that's run by Health and Human Services, but they are going to hotels. They are going to hotels, they are knocking on the doors, they're meeting families. These are career center folks. And sometimes when you knock on those doors in those hotels, they're not necessarily looking for a job right now. They're dealing with crisis. They're dealing with fear. They're, they're, what we're seeing a lot more, too, is trauma, uh, some uh, needs for mental health um, because they've been separated from family, um, separated from uh, their habitat, right? Everything that they know has, has now disappeared. Um, so uh, that's, been, that's been an issue. Uh, but those that uh, are ready for work, uh, we're certainly helping, and uh, one of the issues that we've seen also is licensure, and that that has been a problem for every immigrant, not just um, uh, not just our citizens from Puerto Rico. Um, but when you have, uh, for example, teachers, um, you have a teaching license from Puerto Rico, it doesn't translate to a teaching license here in Massachusetts. So what we have done, um, which uh, has been, I think, great, was suspended the requirement for the Massachusetts license for a year so that um, uh, these teachers from Puerto Rico can actually work here while they work towards getting their, um, their Massachusetts teaching certification, uh, which I think is critically important. And, and I'll tell you, I, um, Sue mentioned that I, I was born in Cuba, and uh, I came from Cuba when I was uh, four years old, and, and both my parents were teachers. And when they arrived here, although they had their PhDs and they were university professors uh, in Havana, their PhDs meant absolutely nothing here. Uh, so uh, they, they did not speak English and they did not have their licenses. So what did they do? They do what immigrants do. They went to work in factories. Uh, my mom worked in a sweater factory. My dad worked uh, in a machine shop. Um, and uh, that is a pretty dangerous for the absent-minded professor that he is. So uh, how, he, how he still has his hands, I'm not sure. Um, but they both went back to school. They both learned English. They both um, got their teaching certificates again. And after 12 years of landing in the United States, they were, they were able to go back to teaching, which I think is a great story. But it's a long trajectory, right? Just think about the, the disruption financially, the disruption professionally that they had suspending their life because their teaching certificate meant nothing here. So, um, so it's an important issue. It continues to be um, you know, the ESL, ESOL training. You know, we have too large of a waiting list in Massachusetts for ESOL. We've got about 17,000 people on a waiting list. Uh, and we need to continue working on knocking that down. Um, because it is such a career killer uh, when you don't speak uh, when you don't speak the language. Um, we had mentioned Chris had mentioned some of the stats on women um, and uh, women in the workplace uh, and you know and the importance of diversity. Fortune 500 companies with the largest representation of women board directors have consistently attained significantly higher financial performance. So we know diversity is important. We know that um, that making sure that you're reflecting your communities is important. And the demographics of Massachusetts are not changing. They have changed. Uh, and the companies that are casting a wider net to have a more diverse uh, employee base are more productive. And if you're more productive, you're more profitable. And this is not, this is not anecdotal anymore. You can look at McKinsey reports. You can look at Deloitte report. You can look at a bunch of reports that tell you that this is just a mere fact. Um, so I leave you with a couple of different things um, that I always ask employers um, when I speak uh, to them is, one is, you know, when you are making your hiring decisions, uh, believe me, I have been in that seat where I need, I need somebody yesterday, three days ago, because production is slipping, you know, uh, pipeline's growing, and you really need to hire someone. It's so much easier to just pick up the phone and call Johnny or Susie that you know. Uh, when we did our survey of employers for our branding, we asked them how do, they, how do they hire people? What's your hiring practice? And we gave them a list of like five different things. And one of those items said um, word of mouth. 87% of our employers hire through word of mouth. 
pretty normal, right? I mean, that's something that's pretty normal. I'm sure that you got, we've all, we've all done it. This is what we do. We hire people we know. Problem with that, it's just not good enough anymore. Because the problem is that we are creatures of, you know, habit, right? So we tend to hang out with the same people. We tend to hang out with people that look like us, think like us, right? And then the problem is that your company suffers because you have no diversity of thought. Uh, your company suffers because you don't have an oppo opposing view and you don't know it all. Uh, and as much as we think we do, we don't know it all. So we need people that disagree with us. Uh, or we need people that just come, come from a completely different background, completely different lens, and understand carefully. And, and, and that when I speak about diversity, I'm not just talking about ethnic diversity. I am talking about older workers. We got a ton of them that need work, and they're incredibly experienced. Uh, I'm talking about veterans that are amazing strategic thinkers, uh, and we need to get them in the workforce if they're not in the workforce. I'm talking about folks with disabilities that we continue to ignore, uh, and we're not doing enough with folks with disability. They have the highest unemployment rate um, in the state, uh, and of course, uh, ethnic, ethnic diversity. So that's my one, one ask. Uh, is about making sure that you're working harder to increase your diversity lens when you're hiring folks. My second ask is to um, look carefully at your job descriptions. Um, because right now, employers, I know, you're calling my office and you're saying, I can't find anybody, you know, what the heck are you doing? Where are these people? And I'm not producing them in my office. Um, but, I, but I will tell you that one of the pieces of advice I can give you is to look carefully at your job descriptions. If your job descriptions, and most of, our, most of us just do uh, have this on there, if it says BA required, take a real hard look at it. Do you really need a BA for the job that you are looking at, that you, are, that you have open? Because remember, now today with online algorithms, if you're the employer and you post BA required and I'm looking for a job and I could be completely, totally overqualified to, to take your job, if I don't have a BA, you're not even going to see me. So we may be cutting ourselves away from a bunch of folks that are super qualified to work uh, and don't have a BA. And there's about 30 million jobs in America that do not need a BA right now. Uh, so I know we're the smartest people in the country. We are, it's been told. Uh, we, uh, we have 50% of the of bachelors uh, in the state, 50% of our folks have bachelor degrees, which is the highest in the country. But we have to start thinking a little bit differently. Um, and our schools um, do such an, a, an incredible job. Um, but in the school system, you know, we need to start hardwiring those schools to job career paths a little stronger. And um, as part of the governor's budget, we've got about $18 million in the Workforce Skills Cabinet budget to really start talking about those career pathways um, and, and, and also that public perception. Again, I'm guilty. I'm guilty of so many things. But I have five kids and four boys, one girl. And I told them all, you're going to go to college. Otherwise, you're not going to be, you're going to not, you know, you're not going to be successful. You have to go to college. And it really, I've had to learn that that's not always the answer. And it really isn't. But we also have to get away from the mindset that it's a job or college. It can be both. This is a both and scenario. This is not an either or scenario. And we just have to get better at having those conversations. Our folk schools are doing a tremendous job uh, preparing kids uh, for anything they want, college or vocations, a tremendous job. Uh, and we just need to get parents to hear that, see that a little bit more. We have a public perception problem when it comes to pathways and alternative pathways uh, after high school. And frankly, it would be my dream that every single one of these 70,000 kids that graduate from high school every single, every single year, I get anxiety every June that 70,000 kids are graduating from high school and 70,000 kids don't have a plan. I wish they did, and we're working on that. That's one of the things that we're working on. Every child that graduates from high school should have some kind of career plan, whatever that is. So with that, I will leave you. Um, you've been a great audience. I know it's late. Uh, thank you for listening. <laughs>